Welcome to the Depression to Expression podcast, my friends. Are you ready to stop eating potato chips and wasting your life watching YouTube videos? Well, look no further and listen no further. This is the podcast episode for you. We're talking to Liam, the founder of FitMind, this amazing meditation app that he has created. We're going to learn some techniques in the podcast as well as what meditation can actually do for us and what they did for Liam and actually what it's done for me. You know, talk about taking intelligent action. Taking intelligent action for mental health or for anyone on the planet, I believe means at least giving meditation a shot. What are you scared of? Now, Liam is actually selflessly given a 60-day trial, 60 days to all members of Depression to Expression. Usually it's a seven-day trial, but if you're a member of Depression to Expression, you get a 60-day freebie. And then, of course, if you don't like it, you can cancel. Liam's very open about that. But let me tell you, this is an app like no other. You know the Waking Up podcast with Sam Harris? He has his own app, Waking Up. You know Headspace, I'm sure. You know Calm. This is totally different, but I won't spoil it for you. If you want to be a member, patreon.com slash depression to expression. This podcast episode is also brought to you by Cars. Cars, they're fast, they're awesome, but don't be afraid to walk some places. All right, and that's it. Here we go. Can't wait to chat with Liam here in a three, two, one. Hello, everyone. We are here with Liam McClintock, founder of Fit Mind. Liam, how's it going? It's great to be here, Scott. Well, you know, how long ago? So I was on your podcast. How long ago was that? Mm, that must have been at least two or three months ago, right? It's, I don't know. Time's, time's weird. <laughs> Time, yeah. So let's just say three months. Okay. So I've been like, we're excited to connect because I've been checking out your, your LinkedIn. We follow each other on like Twitter and LinkedIn. And man, you are busy with the posts. I see like <laughs> you're researching what's new in mindfulness and meditation uh, and, and corporate wellness and then developing your own app. So you got to fill us all in. What's been going on the last few months with, with FitMind first? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's really good to be speaking with you again, first off, because I love the way that, that uh, you think about wellness. And we had that, that last conversation on my own podcast was, was just such a, such a great one. Um, I thought and covered a lot of important topics, but um, yeah, it was yeah. Awesome. So yeah. So uh, FitMind is uh, kind of transitioning a little bit because when we spoke last, I think it was mostly corporate workshops. Um, I've been going into, uh, I was going into mostly technology companies and then started working with some schools and, and addiction recovery centers just to teach meditation um, and, and productivity as well. Um, basically just, just mental wellness generally, but with kind of a meditation focus. Um, and then I wanted to, I wanted to scale it a little bit and the workshops, you know, are, are great and I love teaching in person, but I wanted to reach more folks, um, as many people as possible. And so I think it's somewhat ironic that that meditation is um, being delivered over a phone. Uh, we, we just launched the, the FitMind app last week. But, um, you know, even though it's the device that's causing so much distraction, it is undoubtedly the, the best way to um, to kind of remind ourselves to unplug in the middle or, or be able to um, use a guided meditation at any time, anywhere in the middle of our busy lives. So that's what I was working on over the summer for the most part um, was, was developing that app and creating a program for training the mind and trying to lead people into like a deep, um, a deep meditation practice as opposed to some of the kind of surface level stuff that's, that's gone on um, in the meditation industry, which um, I guess we could talk more about, but that's that's what I've been up to, man, and it's, it's been busy. It's definitely been busy. So if we could rewind, like we spoke about uh, this a bit when I was on your podcast, but but meditation, like you're obviously passionate about it and passionate about mindfulness, but how did you actually get into that? Because people, like it's definitely a popular thing. That's why the, the app store is flooded with, with competition, as you well know. So people know that there's something to this meditation thing. Uh, when did you first discover it? What's your experience been meditating? And, and and we'll go from there. I'm really curious. 
Yeah. So I, when I was younger, I had a really messy mind. Uh, I was diagnosed with OCD and ADHD. Um, so first OCD, when I was about 10, I was diagnosed and it was just, I felt like my mind was kind of tugging me around, if that makes sense. So it would tell me you have to touch every corner of your room in a certain order before you can fall asleep. And, and that might sound silly to people who, who haven't experienced this, but it's basically like this, I, I would call it my icky feeling. It was this feeling like I had to do something. And, um, uh, and that, that's what it feels like to have OCD. And, and so I was seeing a therapist for that. And then I was diagnosed with, with ADHD when I was uh, 16, which I think people are more familiar with that one. You just, you know, my attention span was so short. I was constantly restless. Um, and I was taking medication for that. And then I went on, um, it wasn't until I was in college that I discovered meditation. I just kind of stumbled into it. Um, I was, I was studying the mind at, at Yale, uh, studying psychology and history. Um, but this wasn't something that was taught in school. It was something I stumbled upon through, I think I was listening to uh, Tim Ferriss's podcast on, um, he interviews all these successful people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and, uh, Jimmy Fox. And he said 80 to 90% of these most successful people in the world had a meditation practice. And so I thought, Oh, well, oh, well I want to be successful too. This is the key to success. Um, and so I started meditating really thinking it was just a quick fix, um, kind of stress reduction tool and it might improve my focus a little bit, but I realized all these deeper layers. Um, and so I went on to work in venture capital in, in Boston, but while I was, um, at that firm, I was really, became obsessed with my practice and kind of stopped going out with my friends on the weekends. And I was going on these retreats. Uh, there's some good centers in Boston, Kripalu and the Insight Meditation Center. And as I took my practice deeper, um, I eventually um, just realized that there was so much more to it and started reading a lot of the science literature around it and eventually quit my job in finance to uh, travel to Bali and study meditation full time and get, get certified as an instructor. Whoa, what was, so you were practicing meditation, uh, how long before you quit your job to, to really, you know, get your certification and everything? Let's see if a few years since college, but really, um, you know, I'd only been, at, I'd only been at my job in finance for a year and that's, that, you know, that, that, that year was when I really started going deep in my practice, I think, and discovering that there was a lot more to it than, um, simply calming down, you know, it became kind of a way of life, a different way of seeing the world. So you must have had, okay, in order to take that huge step, which I swear a lot of people think about too. Yeah. I yeah. like people are very, as a, a, a general assumption here, a lot of people aren't satisfied with their work and what they do and quitting is sometimes on their mind, but there needs to be a push and pull factor. So you were being pulled, uh, to this, to this, um, certification in mindfulness but or sort of meditation but what was your experience like the pull must have been you're receiving some benefit you're peeling back these layers and discovering more so were you what were you experiencing that was so uh great was it less ocd symptoms what was oh, oh. the you know before you went to bali it's like well something must have really <laughs> really snapped and said oh there's something to this yeah it's funny because I was, I was thinking back on it and I couldn't remember like the day that I made up my mind to quit my job. I don't know if there was a specific day, but I, I meant to mention earlier that I, w I did get off of my, um, my medication um, through, the, through, through the practice of meditation. You know, it didn't happen overnight, but I was able to get off of the Adderall and um, my OCD got, has improved a lot. I don't even really think about it anymore. Um, and so I guess seeing, seeing that happen and then also... Um, yeah, reading a lot of books about meditation and also about entrepreneurship, I think really just inspired me. Um, I, I always, I was thinking about, I wrote a lot of quotes on my mirror. I love to write quotes on sticky notes and look at them every day. And it's just like programming my mind towards yeah. whatever that is. Yeah. And, and one of the quotes I'd written was a Steve Jobs quote, and I, I'm not going to try to try to pair or try to quote it directly because I would butcher it. But to paraphrase, he said, um, you know, if, if I get up every day and I look in the mirror too many, too many times in a row and I'm not really excited to be doing what I'm doing, then something needs to change. Um, and I, there was another quote that I had from him that said something about just lo living life, looking at your, your life from 
from your 80th birthday and, and thinking about decisions from that 80th birthday vantage point. And so that really got me thinking, all right, what would I regret most at 80? Like staying, I mean, quitting my job and taking a big gamble that might, might end with me living in my parents' basement or, um, or, or staying with my job. And I think that was part of the, the line of thinking. So the line of thinking brought you to, to Bali and to study meditation. So what happens with these instructors? How, how much deeper does your practice go by actually having a, a mentor like that and a teacher? Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's hard to compare. So like Bali was this ideal set of circumstances where I didn't look at a phone. I didn't look at a screen for a full month. I didn't even read a, a book for a full month. Um, I cut out all external information that was previously like inundating my life and, and, uh, was practicing yoga and meditation all day long, eating healthy in the sun with like-minded people. I mean, it was the happiest I've ever been. That said, the practice has become, and I don't want people to listen to this to think in meditation in order to go deep needs to be that way. Um, I think in our regular hectic lives, we're, we're metaphorically lifting heavier weights by training, uh, training the mind in a, in a scenario that's not as idyllic as that practice. But what that did allow was for me to go really deep and, and understand uh, how different the mind behaves when, when, it's, when it's given the right inputs. It's it, just that contrast between a busy schedule constant phone calls and email versus, um, you know, just deep introspection for a month straight was really stark. Whoa. So I think the biggest thing people try to deal with though, is to have, um, relatively busy lives, like probably what you had in finance and, and dealing with these, these incredible inputs where we're sitting and we have these sedentary lives and we're sitting and we're on our keyboards doing this stuff and looking at Excel which goes, which I've always thought about it. I'm like, it's so clear that we can train the mind just by, you know, the work that we do. And, and I got so good at Excel, man, in my, in my, in my job in advertising, I got so, I was dreaming about the thing. I was learning pivot tables and then I don't really use it anymore. And that, that knowledge is lost, but it's really clear that you can train the mind and, and learn a new skill set, and especially with meditation. But what would you say to people who are in those busy schedules who also want to practice this deeper level of meditation, mm -hmm. was that the inspiration behind fit mind for, for the busy mm -hmm. people who want to stay fit mentally? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's completely possible to train the mind with a busy life. And, and it really, the practice becomes about not just the 10 minutes on the cushion. Uh, let's say that's your daily meditation practice. Um, you know, it could be as little as five or 10 minutes a day of sitting down and, and, uh, you know, there's many different techniques that you could be doing. Um, but the practice becomes about integrating that mindset into your daily life and paying attention to where you're paying attention, paying attention to how you're using your mind. Because like you said, with your Excel, uh, uh learning curve, I mean, you can train the mind to do anything, to learn anything. And it really does, cr it becomes adapted to that way of focusing that quality of attention gets trained and that's how it starts to filter the whole world and that's how it creates your whole reality so whatever you're paying attention to is building your mind in each moment and that's what this neuroscience research tells us uh, is that this principle of neuroplasticity which is a f fancy word for just saying that neuro the, the brain is, is plastic it, it can be molded and shaped depending on how we apply it and if meditation is self-directed neuroplasticity, in other words, directing your attention in a certain way that starts to train the mind, then how you interact with your outside environment is experience dependent neuroplasticity. And in other words, your environment is, is training your mind. And so think about, you know, even if you're in a really busy lifestyle constantly with email and, and, and phone calls and scheduling, think about being very deliberate and paying attention to where you're paying attention because that is uh that is training your mind 
do you think a big problem is people um, thinking that multitasking is actually effective and it's kind of tearing our attention apart from one thing to the next and we're being constantly yeah. divided? Yeah, multitasking has been shown to be a myth. In other words, uh, uh, multitasking is just tasking poorly. It's If you look at the, <laughs> the brain, the brain switches rapidly back and forth between tasks it can't pay attention to, to two simultaneously actually there's a fun exercise if, if you'll uh, humor me for a minute here if, if those listening want to place their fingers flat on the surface in front of you if you, if you can do this I'm doing it yeah. um, and and then try to bring your attention you can close your eyes if it's helpful um, as if we're going to meditate and try to focus on the tips of both fingers simultaneously the tips of both pointer fingers at the same time So you're trying to feel the tips of both fingers at once. And what you might notice, and it's very subtle, is that the mind can't pay attention to both tips simultaneously. It, it alternates very rapidly between the two fingers. So it's, it's toggling back and forth. It's like watching a ping pong match. And this is actually a meditation technique where you start to train the attention this way. It rapidly switches back and forth. And this is just one way to experience what's happening to the brain when it tries to multitask and it seems like we're doing two things at once. And it's very hard on the brain actually to, to constantly go in like that. Um, so it results in, in a lower quality of output, but it's also burning more energy. It's mentally fragmenting you. It's been shown to decrease your, your memory. And there's all these other interesting stats that I can't remember offhand about just how much this is costing the U S in productivity, like billions of dollars. Really? 600, 600 billion dollars or something in lost productivity for multitasking um it's such a problem yeah wow Man, <laughs> this was that was the coolest thing ever so is th that was incredible it's exactly what you said it's I, I thought i was at first really good at it and i said no i'm doing it at the same time focusing on my my pointer fingers but when you focus more and really pay attention it's just quickly left right left right left right you can't actually hold that attention to both at the same time. And, and I've read similar studies where a lot of the burnout that we experience at work is really because we're constantly multitasking and our brain literally just gets fried. At the end of a day, it's like we've been just overloading it with information. And then at the end of the day, what hurts is we feel like we haven't gotten enough done because we've done a lot or we've done a little of a lot and yeah. it's not, we didn't get one good thing done. And I suffer from that too. I'm like, yeah, I did a million things, but nothing's done. Right. <laughs> so it's like the productivity does suffer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm really curious about the app that the FitMind app that you've come out with, which, mm -hmm. which use, you, you know, what, what's your pitch for this app? Why is it different than, than let's say a Sam Harris waking up or a headspace or a calm that people are really familiar with? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's, so a couple couple of things, but I think the biggest one and the one that I feel people get the most benefit from is that we explain the psychological mechanisms behind each meditation technique. Um, I think that trying to train the mind without understanding how it works is analogous to trying to learn the piano without knowing how to read music. It's certainly possible. And, and you know, there's the Suzuki method of, of uh, piano where you don't, you don't re learn to mus read music. And, and, and I, I mean no offense to those who, who don't like psychology, then this app might not be for them. Um, and, and I don't go in depth and like overly technical, but just understanding here's why we're applying your attention in these certain ways. Here's how the technique trains your mind. And then also here's how you can integrate it into your everyday life. Like here's a, um, one of the things the app does is after each lesson, so, so there's trainings and lessons. The trainings are the guided meditations. The lessons are paired with each training, just a short two to three minute clip explaining here's what's happening for this technique. Um, and then the next morning you receive a daily challenge, which is paired with that lesson. So let's say you just done a rain meditation, recognize, accept, investigate, non-reactivity. Then the challenge for that day would say, you know, today when you experience really strong negative emotion, instead of reacting to it, just notice it as physical sensations in your body. So you have one thing to focus on that day that will help you integrate your practice so it becomes a way of life, becomes a whole new way of relating to your experience, to your emotions, to your thoughts. 
Um, so, so I think, I think that's our unique angle here is I think mental fitness, this thing that I, I really believe is the next major revolution in health is just that we start to pay attention to training our minds like we do our physical bodies. Um, and, and the app is designed to help people do that. Um, the other thing is the program is a progression of techniques. So it starts out really simple and really basic, um, and then adds 20 seconds each meditation. So by the end of a month, you know, you're meditating for 15 to 20 minutes and but you start out with just five minutes and you start out the first two weeks are focused on intentional training. Um, cause I, cause it attention is, is required to meditate. Otherwise you, you spend the whole time lost in thought. So we spend two, two weeks getting a really good foundation in attention. And then we move to more like advanced techniques, what are considered to be more advanced techniques, um, which are metacognitive awareness starting to become aware of what's happening in the mind at all times. And then, uh, constructive practices like emotional priming or what's traditionally called meta. Um, and then in the last week, there's some really deep practices, which if meditation is like peeling back layers of an onion, that's really getting at the center of the onion. And these are called self inquiry or deconstructive practices, which I don't think are often taught in the West. I mean, they're certainly not on, on the, on any of these other apps. Um, Sam Harris does teach some of these more like glimpse glimpse techniques yeah. Um, so his is a little bit deeper too, but I th I, what I want to do is lead people to realize meditation is not just following the breath. There's so much more there and your mind is a fascinating instrument. You can start to get to know it better and you can tr systematically train it and you can get really good at this without needing to go to the, the mountains and the Himalayas and give up all your possessions. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can still have your day. You don't need to quit your day job just yet unless yeah. you want to. <laughs> but I, I think that's, I, man, that's so like, that is spot on for me. Um, you know, e even the example of what we did our, with our index fingers, is that kind of an example of, of what's in, in the app and how you kind of relate and can um, attribute the psychological effects and what's going mm -hmm. on to the meditation? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that finger switching exercise is one of the, like the 25 techniques that's taught. And that's in the attentional, you know, the first week, it's just building the attention muscles through that exercise. And then the, actually the lesson that's paired with that is multitasking. So we explain all the stats that I wanted to have for this conversation. Sorry, a little <laughs> background. Uh, I'm in the we work right now. So. Oh, that's okay. Um, hey, I and, put you on this, just so everyone knows, I put Liam on the spot. Uh, we just logged into Zoom. I said, let's record and we just hit record. So <laughs> no worries if you don't have those stats memorized. <laughs> No, no worries. But uh, yeah, that, that's how the, that's how it works in, in the app too. And I really think, I think eventually this will be stuff that's taught in school. I think it'll be like the first thing we learn in school is like, Hey, your mind didn't come with it with a user manual. So here's how it works. And we're actually going to, this is what should be taught in school, right? I mean, training the mind is supposed to be the purpose of education. And I was shocked that I had to like stumble into meditation, which is really just mental training. Um, like on my own by accident in college. Um, yeah. I, I think it's wild, but it's a cultural shift that'll take time. Just like physical exercise took, took time. Oh, completely. And you know, we have the phys ed programs in schools and here's, here's the musculature of the body. Here's every single bone. Let's label them. Let's learn, let's exercise. And there's really nothing to do with the mind. And that's going to take time changing the public education system. But what I love about, fit mind what you've done is is just kind of what i preach at, at at schools too like you're giving kids um you're in a high school it's like all right let's learn algebra and every single student is like why <laughs> why are we learning algebra what's the history of algebra what it, let's let's go back to isaac newton okay let's go back to why this actually matters let's let's learn the history let's learn the why and that's actually going to make the practice more interesting if we know some background and know you know what this is all about rather than someone saying okay let's meditate because it's good for you and and it's going to have this effect well how does it have that effect how does it work why is it important i think that's what you've done with fit mind it's like let's give some background let's answer the why first let's have something to go with the practice so it's a little more we don't feel lost when, when there's a why, I think we can, we can better follow a path and are motivated to continue to do it. Right. I absolutely love that. Yeah. I, I, I love this. And you talk about in your Ted talk too, that just this, 
how important curiosity is. And, and I think both of us are, are, were that kid who was always asking why. And it really bummed me out when teachers couldn't tell me why I was learning something or, you know, if, just that adult answer of because I said so, which maybe is necessary right. sometimes, but like you should have an explanation why the kid doesn't put his hand in the cookie jar so that, you know, it's because he doesn't have the self-control yet to realize how, but you can explain that, you know, those cookies aren't good for your long-term health. They're going to give you a sugar spike and then you're not going to feel good. You know, if someone had just told me that, I think it would have more likely, I probably would have still done it. <laughs> but, no, but, but you're, it's so true. Yeah, you're right. But you know what I mean? Like, like knowing that why makes it so much more likely that someone would commit to the practice. And same thing, learning meditation. The reason I wanted to create FitMind is that when I first got into it, the why was actually, it, it's hard to find. Like you have to start reading books that are like buried in, in not common knowledge. I mean, and there's a lot of kind of woo woo stuff out there that will give explanations that, you know, are probably helpful for some people, but they're not scientific. And I, I uh, you know, I tend to err towards what Western science. I think it's a good way of, of, you know, it maps on pretty closely to, to the world and it's helpful. So, um, I think the why is so key. Yeah. Why is key? And you hit the nail on the head. I, I, a, a question for you, though, you know, learning about meditation, going to Bali, doing everything you've done. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about meditation? What are people mm -hmm. still not getting? What do you think people really need to understand about this this practice? Yeah, I, I think... I think there's a lot of misconceptions. One of the biggest ones is that meditation is about emptying your mind of thoughts. And so a lot of the people I teach in workshops say they've tried it and they're actually really frustrated that they can't empty their mind and they think they're just not good at it. And meditation is not about emptying your mind of thoughts. It's about forming a better relationship with your thoughts and emotions. Um, I'll give a couple of analogies. One is that imagine your thoughts are the waves on the surface of the ocean. Sometimes they're choppy, sometimes they're calm and smooth. Um, and if that's where you're at is on the surface, you're just going to get tossed around when the surface is wavy. You're just going to get tossed. Um, and let's say emotions are the currents underneath. So the currents are actually causing a lot of those thoughts at the surface. Um, but again, like you can just be at the whims of the currents if the currents aren't going your way. So meditation is learning to actually become the ocean on command. And that's like a superpower. So you're actually not going to change the surface all that much. Um, now, naturally, you'll notice that actually does start to happen. But initially, the surface can be as choppy as you want it. That's actually mental. That's, that's the practice. That's training. Um, but you're learning not to identify. You're learning to, to actually dive down deep into this well of uh, basically – observation without identification with thought. So the other analogy would be that if for all of your life you've been getting battered by thoughts, which is imagine you're standing under a waterfall and the, the water is the thoughts, that's how we spend most of our lives. And actually a lot of us think we are our thoughts. We think whatever you, you know, we think we are that little voice in our head. And what meditation teaches you is you can step back under the waterfall. The thoughts keep coming down, but you're not identified with them. And so you're no longer getting battered if they're negative thoughts. And again, that's just such a superpower and the, the stream of water will not stop, but it doesn't matter what the stream is because now you've, you've got shelter from it. I so that's, love that. Yeah. It's, ha it's that observer effect, um, almost the, the, the idea that you are not your thoughts and that we, I, we constantly identify with what we're thinking. So if I think if something comes into me like you're such an idiot, therefore I'm an idiot because the thought mm -hmm. came in. Um, so that's a that's a great start for people to say, okay, it's not about emptying your mind. It's about changing that relationship you have with, with what's going on inside. Uh, do you have anything off the top of your head? What other misconceptions we may have? Yeah, let's see. Okay, another big one is that meditation, people don't like say this, but they kind of believe it. Meditation is about getting good at sitting still with your eyes closed. So I think they think if they've had a session where they sat down and they feel calm, that was a good session. And if I sit down and my mind is all over the place, jumping around, that was a bad session. I couldn't meditate that day. I'm a bad meditator. Meditation um, is, is about relating to what's happening in your mind. So 
on the on the days where you least feel like meditating on the days where your mind is most restless that's when you actually have the most opportunity to advance because it's not going to be easy and you're not going to be blissed out but um, again you're learning to observe those thoughts without without judging them um, and then um, you take that mindset into the rest of your day so instead of just feeling like meditation is this thing I do for five minutes a day, it actually becomes all about, you know, you're cleaning the dishes and you think about this awkward encounter you had at work where someone really bothered you. And then you realize all of a sudden, wait a second, I'm not in work anymore. I'm washing the dishes and you come back to the dishes. That is the practice. You do that over and over again until suddenly before you know it, you've rewired your brain so that you're able to be with the dishes instead of lost in this negative scenario, ruminating about the past, where according to one Harvard, Harvard uh, study, we spend about 47% of our day lost in thought, mind wandering. So the more we can come out of our daydream, we can get half of our life back. That is so interesting. And 47% for some, uh, that's on a good day. 90% is on a bad day. <laughs> Um, I think it's higher. I think yeah, it's higher. Yeah, yeah, sometimes, man. Hey, I struggle with that too. Some days are better than others. One thing I find really interesting with meditation and difficult too is it's kind of like yoga where, you know, the it's it's about the journey. The practice is the end result. Like you'll never stop practicing. But what, what of course, in Western culture, we love things with results. We want to do something so then we get something in return. Um, with meditation, do, do you have goals that people should set for meditation? It's like, okay, if you do it for this long, then you're going to feel this way or get this out of it. How, how do you sell meditation to someone when sometimes they're not, there's not necessarily a, a complete fulfilled end to it? Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and that's one of the problems that I constantly think about is how to make this practice more attractive. Uh, because it does go against everything that we're kind of biologically wired to do and also um, goes against, you know, the, there's no six pack in the mirror. It's just hard to incentivize yourself. Right. So I, I think a good way to incentivize yourself, and this is one of the things on the app is like it shows you a daily streak and it shows you total minutes meditated. So you might say, you know, this month I want to, I want to string together a hundred minutes of meditation you know, or, uh, you know, it could be 500 minutes meditation. That'd be ambitious. Um, so you could set you could set a goal as just a streak, like a number of days in a row. Some people are really proud of like medit not missing a day for three years or something. Because even if you sit down for one minute, that's your meditation that day, and that actually goes a long way. So I think streaks is one way. But in terms of the signs you'll start to observe if you stick with the practice, there's there are some telltale signs and. There's kind of a caveat here I'll get into in a minute, but initially what you'll notice when you, when you start to meditate is you'll notice that you become way more aware of what's happening in your mind. So it's almost like someone turned up the volume and you start to hear, wow, I'm kind of insane most of the time. I'm talking to myself and I don't really like what's going on in there. So initially there's that period of like, whoa, I'm, I didn't even realize this was going on. And then, and then all these positive little, it starts out really small. So maybe you stop honking in traffic because you just catch yourself between that stimulus of feeling angry and, and the response of honking and you think, mm -hmm. what was the point of, I, there's no point in honking. Um, maybe it's just you're having a conversation with a friend and you realize that in, your, your phone vibrates in your pocket. Instead of checking it, you're able to stay with the conversation. Um, all these small little things, but here's the caveat you might not notice at first because you're still developing your introspection. You're still developing your metacognition or ability to understand what's happening in your own mind. So the, uh, the, the details or the, the progress is only observable to someone who has made enough progress to actually observe all these small ways, ways that they're changing. Right. So it, be, it becomes more, the, the changes become both larger over time, but you also become more aware of them. Um, but there's all these small little markers, of, you know, you're just better able to concentrate on one task. You're, you're not, you know, you don't hop right on social media without thinking about it. Um, you start to take more control of your life. And these are things that, you know, you said telltale signs that many people experience, but the timeline is usually different depending on the person and depending how long they practice a lot of variables there. Yeah, everyone's mind is different, and 
and there's a lot of different variables. Um, meditation is such a personal practice and it's, it's really impossible to compare yourself to someone else. I mean, you gotta, um, you know, you look at where you're at now and you just try to notice the improvements that, that, you know, it's like each day you just become a, hopefully a slightly better person. Um, I think that's anyone's goal who's into self-development is to try to be a better person the next day than, than they are today. And, um, through meditation, you start to, you start to see those changes. Um, there's a guy named Jay Shetty, who's a, a really popular former monk whose YouTube videos get billions of views. And he's got this one, he's really good at coming up with clickbait titles. He, it's course. called, it's called why, why meditation made me, why meditation made me a jerk. Um, or why meditation made, made me, yeah, basically why meditation made me a jerk. Okay. And of course it's not what the video is about, but he wanted, and he got me, I clicked on it. Yeah. Um, and what he said was so true. He said, meditation um, didn't make me a jerk, but I realized all the ways in which I already was a jerk. So I realized the subtle ways that I was like manipulative, where my intentions weren't good, my motivations weren't good, where I was harming other people by not giving them my full attention or, um, uh, you know, he started to become more self-aware and that is self-awareness is like one of the main benefits that all these change that catalyzes all these changes because you see, you see it happening in real time. You see what's happening in your mind in real time. And that's something, uh, you know, the Nobel prize winning psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote thinking fast and slow and, um, does a lot of work on cognitive biases and how the human mind is set up for all sorts of errors came on a podcast recently, Sam Harris's podcast. And he said, you know, I've, I've been studying all these cognitive errors for three decades and I haven't gotten any better at decision-making. And so I thought it, I thought about that a lot. I was like, is, does that mean it's pointless? Does that mean it's hopeless for the rest of us? And then I realized he's studying it. He's reading about it, but he's not observing it in real time as it's happening. The only way that the only way you can become aware and change your behavior is to notice the mind as it's reacting in that moment. You can't read about it in a book. It's experiential learning. Wow. I think, well, that's, you know, I think a, a barrier to people, even going through any kind of self-improvement technique and, and meditation for one especially is, is you might discover that maybe you are a jerk and it took me some real introspection too, to, and I continue to do so that, yeah, I'm doing this and that's not, that's not good for my mental health or I'm doing this and, and you know what? Yeah, I think I am a little um, demonizing and maybe I think I'm better than other people in this sense. And you realize these things and that's actually a scary experience in meditation, I think, to really sit with your own thoughts because, we're again, we're constantly multitasking, we're sitting down. Like I was doing a talk at a school and I'm just like, when was the last time you just, you just sat in quietness, right? Sat in, in even the dark and just sat and was quiet. Cause I come home, turn on Netflix and I got the tea kettle going and then I'm putting on some music and then I got the VR headset and I'm like locked in and I'm ready to go. But what about just sitting and noticing? And for a lot of us, uh, that, do you find that can be a scary experience? Yeah. Looking inward is scary, man. Yeah. It's, it's scary at first. You realize all the cobwebs. Um, it's like shining a flashlight in, you know, uh, into this like kind of scary place. And, and I think people don't like to look inward. I mean, we, we naturally like to distract ourselves. I think you would have to be kind of a, a, a psycho and unless you had found meditation to be sitting on a park bench in 2019 and just, and just sitting there and not have your phone out because you've got the whole world's entertainment on your phone right. and you've got, um, you know, you've got endless entertainment and communication. Why wouldn't you pull out your phone? Why would you want to sit there? Well, as it turns out, sitting there is one of the best things for you because you're forced to look inward and figure out what's going on with your mind. And that gives you all these opportunities to, um, that gives you all these opportunities to learn about yourself and then change the parts of yourself that you don't like. But that initial, and man, I'm, I gotta tell you, I'm no saint. I mean, I'm still working, but, but you know, I've, I think I'm much more aware of the areas that I need to work on that previously were completely hidden. But, um, uh, but meditation is kind of shining that flashlight inward. I think introspection is we're, I mean, we're in a distraction crisis and distraction is like the opposite of introspection. 
Mm. I think it's I think it's what our society needs. Well, I, I also think that that and I tell this to a lot of people too, we're scared to even, you know, as a child, you don't want to look under the bed for because you're afraid of a monster, you're afraid of introspection, because you're going to see some cobwebs or a monster. Mm. But at least if you shine the flashlight in there, and there is a monster, at least you know what you're dealing with. It could be a big one, could be a small one, but you really know what you're dealing with and the unknown is kind of gone in that sense. So you know how to really, okay, what weapons do I need to take this motherfucker down? So <laughs> I, I think introspection is scary, but for me, at least it gets rid of a lot of unknowns. And I think for a lot of us too, the unknown is also scarier than introspection too, or at least if we invite them to people to think about it that way. So shining on the cobwebs at least you know what kind of cobwebs what kind of monster what kind of dirty basement you're actually dealing with yeah and and you can start to identify the root causes of of a lot of your issues i mean if you don't shine that flashlight it's just going to keep it causing waves on the surface you know it's like would you rather be up there or would you rather figure out what's causing those waves um that's why one of my favorite psychological tools recently has become paying more attention to my dreams too. writing down my dreams every morning. I don't think we pay enough attention to, to sleep and dreams. Um, we spend so much of our lives in sleep and dreams and some of the best psychologists of all time, Carl Jung and Freud wrote whole books about dreams because they actually reveal the subconscious mind stuff that sometimes is unavailable to our conscious recognition. So, um, that in part is the practice of meditation too, is to make more of your subconscious conscious to become more conscious of what's going on in your nervous system. That's kind yes. of causing all the currents. Well, we do really live in uh, like up on the surface, of course, mm. everything it's, it's, and it's, again, it's scary to, to look, look in. Have you ever done one of those, um, uh, sensory deprivation tanks? Did we talk about this on your podcast? I don't know. We should have. Yeah. Hey, I, I did love you ever, that. Do, have you ever used those? Yeah. Yeah. I've done that, you know, five or six times now and, and I'd like to make it a more regular habit. It's a little expensive, but definitely, you know, the first time I did it, I felt like someone had just pressed a reset button on me. Like a yes, complete, yes. Re I walked out of there like 10 pounds mentally lighter. It was amazing. Yeah, right. It's like you were seeing the world for the first time. Yeah. It's like you're just unplugged from the matrix and, <laughs> and you're walking out. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, were there any, what kind of, again, result you felt like you're 10 pounds lighter? Why do you think that is? Did you come to some realization, some breaking point? Like what happened? Yeah, I, I, I can't explain the mechanism here, but I, you know, I can try to understand a little bit about what's going on. Um, when you eliminate the sensory deprivation tanks, for those who, who don't know what we're talking about, you've, you've eliminated all sensory data so that the water is the same temperature as your body and you're floating in salt. So you can't feel anything. It's pitch dark and it's soundproof. So you can't, all of the senses are shut down when that happens. And because normally all of through all these senses we're, we're receiving, I think it's about 11 million, 11 million bits, like in computer terms of information per second is coming in. We only perceive actually 50 bits per second consciously of that 11 million. So that shows you how little we're aware of what's actually influencing us. But when you shut all of that down, um, it's just like a brain in a jar. It's just you and your thoughts. And this is what happens on a silent meditation retreat too. Um, you're alone with your thoughts and you start to you start to realize and all these suddenly you can't hide. You can't distract yourself from what's going on in there. And so as a result, you have to process it. And I think that processing, just recognizing it, just seeing how crazy you are is actually really cathartic. Um, the mind races around for a while and then it starts to calm down a little bit if you're lucky in the, in the sensory deprivation tank. Um, cause it starts to get tired of, of itself. It starts to get tired of trying to make you do any, do stuff. It, eventually it realizes you're not going to do anything and it's, you know, there's nothing interesting for it to kind of think about and process. So eventually it starts to quiet down. And again, I don't know the exact mechanism behind why I felt exactly so good, but um, it's a meditative experience. You know, you really start to see you first, you see how crazy you are and then you see yeah. the, that there's a quiet point underneath all that. Mm. 
it's almost like opening up a can of worms and I did it once and I came to some pretty profound realizations but you notice yeah there's you've been compressing a lot and kind of the the lid opens when you're in these tanks or in meditation and a bunch of stuff just flies out and you you get to process it and catch some and look at it all and you're like wow that's a lot of garbage and <laughs> It's it's pretty it's a pretty amazing experience. You're right, it is a little expensive, um, but I think like to put money aside, I'd love to just do that once a month, and that can be you know just the start of every month. You start with that, and it I think it can also accelerate um, if you are using FitMind as a practice, and in in turn you're also doing some sensory deprivation, woo, mixed with a little silent retreats. You're well on your way to become uh, become very monkey. Now, yeah. um, Liam, just just before we go, uh, for all the listeners, uh, we're gonna put a a link for the FitMind app for you to you know take a look, read about it. But Liam, what would you like to say to all the listeners um, about FitMind and and you know if they if they should download or not? What's what's the pitch? <laughs> like, what would you like to tell them? Yeah, give it a shot. I mean, the first week is free, so I think you have nothing to lose there. And then it's five dollars a month um, thereafter, which is you know less than half the cost of the other meditation apps. Um, but you know, more than anything, you know, FitMind has become a living for me. But I really do feel passionately about um, about folks training their minds. And as we as we were just talking about, there's so many good tools out there float tanks is a tool, yoga is a tool, meditation is a tool. Um, these tools will resonate with people differently because everyone you know, has their own interests and, and you know, you should find what works for you. Find the, the teachings that, that work for you. I think one of the benefits of the FitMind app is that we give you a full spectrum of practices so that instead of going to a bunch of different locations like I did do when I started meditating, you can get that that full array explained in kind of scientific and Western language in one spot. But that said, I encourage people, you know, after they've checked out the app, I don't think that should be the entirety of your practice. If you get inspired, you know, you might try one of these Goenka 10 day retreats or maybe on the less extreme end, you might just, you know, do try a weekend. Um, maybe it's just on your own doing like a self retreat, cutting out. Um, <laughs> there's this whole like trend now called a dopamine fast and it's essentially a, a self meditation retreat. You're just sitting alone with your thoughts and cutting out, um, you know, screens and, and, um, a lot of stimulating activity for a day. So everyone will find, I think what works for them best. And there's a lot of good tools out there. If you're, if you're curious and, and want to learn, want to improve your mind and your mind can be trained. I mean, it is incredible. It, it, it's with us all the time. It determines your entire experience of the world and it determines your life in each moment. I mean, it's like your own personal movie camera. So it's worth paying attention to and it, it really does pay dividends. Liam, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I know we'll continue to stay in touch. Everyone else, thank you so much for listening. Download the FitMind app. Give it a try. If it resonates, that's great. If not, I'm sure it's a tool that will project you forward into your meditation practice. Um, Liam, thanks so much. Everyone, stay strong. Keep being you, and don't forget to express yourself and meditate.